Duran Premium Cigars, one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Palayo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran <coughs> Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offer the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the Ultra Premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Azan Cigars, Naya, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed to humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure the progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium <laughs> your standard. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Welcome back, everyone, to the Stogie Geek Show. We've got another fabulous interview for you this evening. Glenn Loop from the CRA comes back to the show to give us some updates, which I think are very timely and very, very important. Glenn, welcome to the show. It's great to be back. We ought to do this, like, all the time. Yeah, I think it should be a regular thing. I think it's, uh, of course, that important. Um, we thank you for all of your work and all of the work from the CRA um, to protect our rights as cigar smokers. It's a team effort. Uh, we couldn't do it without mediums like yours uh, that help us spread the word as to why cigar consumers have to be engaged in this process. So you're as much of a partner as, as any of our staff, and we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Now, Glenn, uh, you made a I, – I follow you very closely on Facebook, and you made a post recently that said that we were, you know, mentioned in some press recently about, you know, legislation to watch um, as Obama's term in office is, is starting to come to a close. And, uh, you know, tobacco was, was kind of number one on the list. I don't know if it was in any particular order, um, but I think that kind of, uh, you know, heightens our, our senses and raises awareness about, about this cause. Well, it absolutely does. And The Hill, which is a, a noted periodical in Washington, uh, came out this weekend with its list of nine regulations to watch in the final moments of the Obama administration. Uh, we, we did make the list. Um, I don't think we should be proud of that. Mm, <laughs> I think we ought to be no, worried no. about that. Yeah. But <coughs> in numerous strategy sessions you know that, that this matter has come up, it's a well-known fact, Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter which party. Every president that's leaving office tries to make their mark on their legacy mm -hmm. by rolling out a plethora of regulations impacting everything from the environment to you name it. So every time I think we've got it bad, I look at our friends in the coal industry or financial services or water regulation or immigration or, or, or keep going mm -hmm. down the line. And you realize we're in this giant mess and pot together. When I look at the battles that the United States Chamber of Commerce takes on, when I look at battles other special interests take on, industries that are really truly the backbone of American economic growth, and they've got it bad too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Absolutely. this is just another attack on small business, just like the attacks that are coming down the pike on big business. We're all in this together, and that's why there's just endless strategy sessions and lobbying and advocacy work and grassroots mobilization taking place across the board. The problem is, it's the, really the first time in history that cigar smokers have been asked to be engaged in this process. Now, Glenn, one of the scary things for me was the, the way the article was written. It said, you know, tobacco was kind of like the headline. And then it lumped uh, vapes and e-cigarettes in with that, which is, of course, not tobacco, which to me showed some of the ignorance that uh, is, is happening on the Hill. And I know that's something you work very hard to... Uh, kind of set the record straight on. Well, that's correct in, a, in one vantage point. In this deeming rule, we are lumped in together. They want to regulate e-cigarettes and cigars and pipe tobacco and, and hookah in exactly the same fashion mm. as cigarettes and smokeless. Right. So under, when you read the 241 pages of this regulation, 
there is no difference, and that is a mind-boggling part of this process. Mm-hmm. We're, so we are actively engaging in a dialogue with the White House Office of Management and Budget, which is the ultimate arbiter in this entire question, on separating the rules they may want to go down the path for with e-cigarettes and leave us alone. Because believe me, and I've said this a thousand times publicly and privately, if it weren't for e-cigarettes, we would not be having this conversation. They, the agency is so anxious to get its arms around e-cigarettes and to regulate e-cigarettes that we're virtually collateral damage. And it's really because of one thing. They are scared out of their minds about the psychology of e-cigarettes, and that is, quote-unquote, normalization of smoking, the appearance of normalization of smoking. Nothing could be further from the truth for you and me and every other cigar smoker in America. None of us crave this cigar. Mm -hmm. We go to great pains to talk about addiction and inhalation and how we are not subject to those types of debates within the healthcare community. The problem is our opposition has gone to great pains to lump us in to make it sound like, you know what, I'm enjoying this incredible, right now I'm smoking a Rocky Patel Prohibition, and in about 12 minutes I'm going to have a craving for a Marlboro cigarette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they think. I know. We all know that nothing could be further from the truth. Also, Glenn, I think playing into it, too, and I I recently became aware of some regulations in the city where our studio is in here in Rhode Island, and that is the perception that youth gravitates towards things like hookah and e-cigarettes and vape. And, you know, one of the regulations, for example, is in my particular city that I'm in, you cannot serve alcohol in a hookah lounge. Because there has been an incident in the past where there's been too much underage drinking. Now, when you look at how cigars are regulated in my state and even in my particular city, that's not the case. And to me, that was just one of the sharp contrasts between uh, some of the different forms of so-called smoking. I mean, because vape isn't really smoking, right? But that's some of the differences that uh, you know we can draw. It and, and hopefully, you you know, you're working very hard on the hill to make those differences apparent. You're absolutely right. And, and in fact, not just in Washington D.C., but nothing has driven the issue of tightening up smoking bans more than the issue of hookah. Mm. Uh, we went through that where there was a battle in the state of Oregon where the target was hookah mm-hmm. because of this. Aura, or however you want to put it, that hookah was bringing young people in and therefore getting them addicted, blah, blah, blah. Well, in Oregon, there was there's no difference between a, a cigar shop and a smoking lounge. And that's where there needs to be greater legislative definition as to what a cigar lounge is and a cigar bar is. And I think examples now exist in Oregon, and especially the, the legislation that just passed in the state of Nebraska this year, where it is specifically noted by statute, cigars only. And I think that that's going to become more of a state trend. And so it's not only going to be an educational effort in Washington, it's going to be efforts in these state capitals, Mm. educate them one at a time. And it's going also could end up being a great pathway to greater cigar exemptions under state law smoking bans. Mm. Yeah, I think that's important. It's I, you know, as you know, it's important to highlight the states that got it right, like Nebraska, um, and, and make that apparent in the other states and even cities, right? Because there could be city ordinances that limit these types of smoking bans. Absolutely. And, you know, we all get tired of walking into a bar that does allow smoking and they say cigarettes only, <laughs> which is the ultimate oxymoron. It's unbelievable, Glenn. I've yeah. been in, in outdoor areas in a restaurant where there's big signs that say no cigar smoking. Like cigarettes are okay in an outdoor environment. Hooters. Hooters has made a national stand where you can smoke on their patios, but mm-hmm. not cigars or pipe. Right. And I don't understand that at yeah. all. Well, the difference is, and some people get angry with us because we don't take those types of issues on, like when Starbucks you know, bans smoking mm-hmm. on, their, on their patios and the like. I have to rack that up as a private property Absolutely. corporation decision, and yeah. I'd much rather have Starbucks drive that decision for their company than have the government dictate that for them. Mm-hmm. Right, and then we as consumers certainly have the right not to partake in Starbucks. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, for a lot of reasons I, beyond, I, I beyond agree. cigars, not to get too political about it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, did you have more, more questions for, for Glenn? Glenn, so how's, I mean, it seems like now Congress is uh, getting back into session, so is the lobbying efforts now going to be stepping up again with, with uh, our friends back on the Hill? Absolutely, uh, and it didn't take long at all. In the last 24 hours, we've picked up two new co-sponsors. 
uh, Representatives Kurt Schrader, Democrat of Oregon, and Republican Mark Walker, Republican of North Carolina, uh, came on in the last 24 hours of them being back from uh, their August recess, and that put us up at 134. And we can announce on Stogie Geeks tonight that by morning, uh, number 135 will be on the list. I'm not going to put out his name, but uh, there will be a congressman from Michigan added tomorrow, so that'll uh, put us at a solid 135 uh, by tomorrow afternoon. The goal is to get it really back up, uh, and it's really political semantics that drives this, is, is up to a solid 150. We have 17 in the Senate. Uh, when I say semantically, this is all about political messaging, truly. Uh, whether or not this legislation passes, we do know that this legislation is shaping and molding the regulatory process. That was evident by the way the FDA took our definition of premium cigar out of the legislation and included in the path to exemption in the 241-page deeming rule. So we know that it's influencing the process. We know that the White House Office of Management Budget is listening to the Hill. We know that they're more susceptible to political messaging than our, you know, than the bureaucrats at FDA are. So that's the reason we have to keep the energy alive on this legislation. It's why we have to keep petitions going to members of Congress. In the last three sessions, it's been over 350,000 petitions to Congress. When you put over a quarter of a million into Congress, um, you're going to get on the radar screen. Right now, just to personify that, now with the number that have come into these offices, we go into an office and we say we're here for H.R. 662. They go and say, oh, the cigar guys are here. Um, it does get on their radar screen. Right now, we're engaged in a campaign to boost our, our constituent outreach to, for example, U.S. Senator Joe Donnelly of Indiana. The, the office specifically asked for constituent input on this issue. Hmm. And so we're going to be circulating the, the petition links to every cigar shop in Indiana. We released it to our all of our mailing lists in the state of Indiana. Two years ago, when Senator Bob Casey from Pennsylvania was in a tight re-election, we hand-delivered 6,700 petitions to his office. It had a great influence. If we did that across the country, our messaging would be so much simpler, and that's, again, why consumers have to be engaged in this process. Hey, Glenn, uh, Robbie Straits here, PDR Cigars. Um, you talked about a new vote coming in in Michigan, a new guy coming in in Michigan. And maybe there's some retailers listening to this show in other states that are being affected by this. How impactive is a guy like Mike Nolan that owns Nolan Cigars up in uh, Traverse City, Michigan? And he fought for their cap there. He's done so much legislatively. How, 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 has he helped you with that? In, in Mike, Mike Nolan is a, is a political gem in this industry. He's absolutely amazing. Uh, what's, so to speak, sad is that there's only so many Mike Nolans in each state. Hmm. <laughs> right. I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you this, Glenn, not to interrupt you, but um, yeah. at IPCPR, I went to the state legislation, so, uh, state um, association practice. breakfast, yeah. right. and I was I, I think I was the only manufacturer represent, representative there, and out of the 50 states, uh, the tables that were there, I bet you there was only maybe 20 that had people sitting there. It was them. unbelievable. Yeah, I was at that breakfast too. And oh, it was you were? Like, yeah, and it was like absolutely unbelievable how like whole states and important states were underrepresented there. You know? Oh, it's amazing. I'm, I remember that morning I was there and I remember my, my great friend Vartan with, with Ambassador oh, yeah. Star in Phoenix. Phoenix. He was alone. He was alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what are there, like uh, 7,000 cigar shops in Greater Phoenix? Yeah. I mean... 70. <laughs> yeah, seventy in <laughs> Phoenix. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and he was alone. And you know, this goes back to a, a conversation I had with Shorty Cable at Havana Connections, my dear friend in Richmond, when we were getting the Cigar Association of Virginia off the ground in 2006. And this was obviously way before there was a CRA. And I said, guys, you've got to build politics into your job description. You are no longer just tobacconists anymore. Mike Nolan personifies that. Um, you know, Ken and Julie Newman in Illinois personify. Yeah, absolutely. That. Um, I could go around the country. Harris Saunders in Alabama personify. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Tim Luffman in Georgia. You know, I could go around the country. Harrison and started one, the ATA. You know, I can name one or two, one or two, three, maybe, sometimes a handful, by state. Ken Pennington in, in Texas. 
uh, noted great tobacconists who knew that they had to start making those road trips to their state capital to make their message heard. And Mike Nolan and the, and the retail community in Michigan rallied behind the tax cap that you noted and, and got the job done. And now it's become a, a great model for the rest of the country. We just used uh, the work that they did in Michigan uh, to help spearhead the effort that Gary Colsayer's got going to get a tax cap in New Jersey. And they've pulled together a great coalition in New Jersey at the Tobacconist. Why? Because they're realizing they got to get their rear ends to Trenton. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. They've got to get in those state capitals. They've got to lay groundwork. Well, they know that this is time away from their business, but they're doing it. And, and if every tobacconist in the country galvanized their consumers and galvanized their fellow brethren in the industry, we, we would be so much farther along. So Michigan and Texas have great state associations. And I actually went up to Mike Nolan at that breakfast, and I said, Mike, I'm going to apologize to you. And he looked at me, and he said, well, what are you talking about? I said, because when I go to the, all these other states and they tell me we're going to put together state associations, I always tell them, I'll give you Mike Nolan's phone number. Now, I've never asked Mike Nolan if I could do that, but I know Mike Nolan <laughs> is a guy that would help hmm. these. And I went to the uh, last year's trade show, and I, uh, we were sponsors, and we got an award with the Texas Association, which is a huge one, very powerful. Sure. And uh, they talked about how when they got off the ground, they actually had Mike Nolan come and speak to them. And the reason why I'm saying this, I, I might be stepping out of bounds here on the no, show no, no, because no. I don't know. No, anything. Not all. But Mike, part of the conversation. Mike Nolan, he might be a name that everyday cigar smokers don't know of, and he's only in Michigan. He helped them, but he's very powerful in what he does. And I, I mean, I think he needs to be. I think more people need to know who he is. You know, it's well, I interesting. It's I, a, I, I spent a lot of time in universities, and I spent a lot of time in computer security, and a lot of people will say, well. What's everyone else doing in universities? What, what are other universities doing? Or when I talk to people in the financial industry, they're like, well, we want to do security, and what does everyone else do? It's a it's very similar situation It should be here, the same. Right? Benchmarking. It, you hope it's, it's the same basic, here. basic, you know. Yeah. What did Michigan do? And, you know, we're looking in New Jersey to do the same kind of legislation. Well, what did, yeah. what, what did Michigan Look, do? Texas has one of the, the strongest state associations, right? They, do, they are. They, they are. And they have no threat. They really don't have a threat. Well, they've got that every other year smoking ban battle that they they constantly fight, and they consistently have tax issues that they cannot ignore. And I'll I'll never forget this. I was on my way to to Chattanooga to burn for an event several years ago, and I was almost into Tennessee, and Ken Pennington called me from Texas and said, you're not going to believe this, but this woman in the House of Representatives in Texas at the 11th hour slid in a smoking ban into the budget bill. (laughs) <laughs> I never cease to get uh, amazed by the creativity of our opposition into the budget bill under the premise that if you pass a smoking ban, you will save the state of Texas $300 million in health care costs, you know, of course, in the first 12 months. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's insane. Yeah. And, and she slid it into that bill. Now, it was killed in the Texas Senate. It's sort of like things happen in, in Alabama and Mississippi and West Virginia. Things pass one chamber and fail in the other, and you can almost predict the outcome, almost. But you have to take every threat seriously. So when she successfully got that into the Texas House bill, they had to scramble to kill it in the Senate bill. Well, it's a reason to be galvanized. We, we have to train ourselves as consumers and retail tobacconists to react in these, even if we think it's going to die. Pennsylvania is notorious for this, and frankly, the threat even gets more serious as time goes by in Pennsylvania, where you can bank on a tax increase and an OTP increase being implemented in Pennsylvania, passing the House, dying in the Senate, being advocated by by the governor's office every single time. But we still have to train ourselves to take every one of those threats seriously. When Ken Pennington called you and said that, that this lady in Texas did that, I would have said to him, did Pelosi move to Texas? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, every state's got a Pelosi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kay Hagan. But, you know, Jeff Kay Hagan. Ohio, That's really I, funny. I'm I, not to offend any Democrat out there. I, I, I don't mean to be political like that. I'm just I think saying. It's, it's kind of funny because I always say in everyone's life, you have a Fredo from the Godfather. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's kind of a similar <laughs> analogy, right? Yeah. Right? yeah. Now, and another great tobacconist is been taking on the political uh, fight 
uh, in his state capital for the, one of the first times in, in history is Jim Clark in Ohio, and uh, really been aggressive at, at working their capital for, for tax measures and killing Governor John Kasich slash presidential candidate John Kasich, governor of Ohio, who's who put in an, a bill to raise the OTP in the state of Ohio and cigar. So I don't want viewers to forget that. It was this governor, this Republican governor in Ohio, who proposed that. Um, I'm also fond of reminding people that, that Governor Mike Huckabee is the one who signed a smoking ban in the state of Arkansas when he was governor. It's important for cigar consumers to know these things. Don't forget and, Scott and Walker, that, either. Don't forget yeah. Scott Walker in Wisconsin. Scott Walker was Milwaukee County Executive. It's amazing. You get in this job and you start to realize this is a small yeah. country. You start remembering. Yeah. <laughs> but Scott Walker was Milwaukee County Executive, uh, publicly stated his opposition to a state smoking ban, said he would work to rescind it or modify it if he got elected governor, got elected governor, and uh, didn't happen. And also, yep. he put in a, a budget measure that would have, it died, but the governor proposed it, it would have charged uh, smokers on the state payroll higher insurance premiums. Yeah, and I tell people, we don't want to get, you know, obviously we don't want to get political, but, you know, if cigar smoking is important to you, you should really remember these things that some of these candidates have done. Well, Pat, I would ask you, and I'm sure you have this on the website, so I'm going to prompt it. <laughs> when we go on to the CRA.org website, you have a list of people, if we're cigar like minded people, that we should be voting for in our states? We're going to be releasing that before the election. It's not there yet, but we are definitively going to be releasing uh, a list of those, especially if they are uh, co sponsors of our legislation and if they're in tight re elections. Uh, it's not there yet because we don't want to release it too early. But going into the uh, next round of elections, we will definitively be releasing that list of uh, friends of the cause. We've done that every cycle. That's awesome. <clears throat> Glenn, Jared, uh, Jared Trudeau from Kristoff. Um, I, I think it's funny, and I'm sure you've seen it across the country, as you mention all these examples of people who are really important legislatively. Just here in the Northeast... I mean, the Massachusetts Tobacconist Association, the MTRA, they've been doing big things. They hired a lobbyist. They've been moving. And here in Rhode Island, we've got some great retailers that all banded together. They're in competition with each other. As you know, it's very competitive, and it's a very small state. So, very, everybody's, I mean, so everybody's five so miles close. away from yeah. each other. You know, yeah. so, And they successfully got together quite a few years ago and, mm -hmm. and, and passed the 50-cent cap. And they've never seen sales that were better. You know? He is good at so, Oh, listen, the, the Rhode okay. Island uh, economic model was used in New Jersey. It was used in Connecticut mm -hmm. when they got there, successfully got their yeah, tax. Absolutely. Um, and, and your boss, Glenn Case, has been fabulous, by the way, at coming to Washington and helping to uh, yes. uh, walk absolutely. the whole United States Congress to tell the message on behalf of manufacturers. Uh, Will, any closing uh, questions for Glenn? Yeah, Glenn, so, I mean, a lot of folks are asking me right now, um, obviously, the uh, they're still in the review period, I guess, of all those comments, and um, where where do things stand as far as, what can we expect, maybe in the crystal ball, as far as the FDA coming down with something? Well, I think the crystal ball says there's a lot of political pressure to get something out in the September, October range. That begins a review clock by the White House Office of Management Budget, so we'll be able to restart the clock, if you will. When the final rule is delivered there, that's when we will know how bad things are. Um, I don't have to get into all of that laundry list again, but I can give you the quick bullet points. If we get caught up into pre-market approval on blends, it's off to the courts. Um, mm. If Or yep. get it revised through the White House Office of Management and Budget. But September, October is the conventional wisdom now. Keep in mind, FDA has missed nine different deadlines to date, so you can't hold, you know, they missed the June 30th deadline, but... Um, the smart money says it's going to be sometime this fall, and I think that's the reason that Hill article that we've referred to in the beginning of this came out. Um, I want to highlight also just a couple of things on the background. We recently had a very successful meeting with the United States Small Business Administration, who wrote a seven-page letter to the FDA that said, if you go down the path that you have proposed, you're going to put 50% of the premium cigar market out of business. That's a given. Uh, there's no way that a lot of companies uh, can be afford to be regulated when annual compliance costs could be between three hundred fifty and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, twenty to fifty thousand dollars to put out every single SKU. Uh, the SBA has agreed to be an advocate for our side of the cost, so it's wonderful to kind of pit one federal agency against another in that mm -hmm. regard. And it was a great meeting. Um, we're also taking that message consistently to the White House Office of Management and Budget because 
IPCPR and, and CRA, we are jointly funding uh, former U.S. Senator Mary Landrieu as a consultant to the executive branch. And she's opened numerous doors for us uh, to get our message across specifically to this administration. In May, there was a very successful meeting with OMB uh, where representing CRA was, was George Padron and Carlito Fuente. Representing the retailers was Craig Cash from North Carolina. Uh, so two of our consultants, they were the only ones allowed to go into meeting. And uh, that was really where we came across, came out of the meeting, at least you know, George and Carlito expressed this to our manufacturers at our New Orleans meeting, that they truly got the difference. They truly understood and grasped the difference. They want to treat the premium side differently. They're just grasping for how. And it's up to us to help guide that process and hopefully they'll listen to the wisdom. They tax a durable good. And then they, uh, they, we get used to that tax and that revenue. Then they get greedy. They want to overtax it where they're going to lose that, that revenue from it. Right, Glenn? Well, they're going to raise user fees on the industry. And that's not going to help anybody in terms of the pricing of cigars. And obviously, listen, they're very candid about it. They call it the end game. The prohibition of tobacco. That's not a term of art. That's not being overly dramatic. That's what they call it. So that's the way we should treat it. Like these bureaucrats are after our passion to end the use of tobacco in any way, shape, or form. If you read the deeming rule, this cigar is nothing short of a path to nicotine addiction. As I said early on, we all know that that's simply not true. It, but they're, that's not stopping our opposition from painting that picture that this is a mass market product, that this is a pack of cigarettes, that this is nothing more than injecting pure nicotine into your bloodstream, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it shows how far behind we are in the educational process. But as I'm fond of saying, we're not going to be the first industry and we're not going to be the last that claws its way back from political Armageddon. And again, that's why we have to galvanize this base of ours, whether it's the consumer or the retail community. Listen, I am amazed at the number of manufacturers who think that once this rule comes out this year, probably, that that's it. Mm. That's what we have to deal with. Well, no. Mitch, no. Mitch Zeller, I've got to say this. I was at the NATO meeting in, in uh, April, the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, where, where Mitch Zeller, the director of the FDA Center for Tobacco Products, stood up in front of the crowd and said very candidly, quote, this is just the beginning. <laughs> mm-hmm. After that, Jeez. they're going to get into advertising and marketing restrictions. They're going to get into distribution types of regulations. They're going to get into best manufacturing practice standards. That's a given. Those are fights months and months and years and years down the road. To, again, mm-hmm. ask our friends in financial services or the coal industry or energy or the environment. Go down the pike. Once a federal agency gets their claws in you with the power to regulate, it is always just the beginning. So this fight's never going to go away. So that's the reason the petitions have to consistently flow. Consumers have to be trained to be engaged. And that's why we need guys like you to help us spread the message. Yeah. I think manufacturers, a lot of the time, speaking from a manufacturer's perspective, I think manufacturers sometimes get confused when they see, um, when they see on the agenda, like, uh, well, well, we'll just deal with it, like you had just said. We'll just deal with it. Well, the reason why big tobacco companies say we just deal with it is because they have an addictive product, and they make billions and billions and mm. hundreds of billions of dollars. So they're not stressed because they know they'll keep making that money. Because they, But we are the very fact that the premium cigar business is stressed about it should show the government, right. the FDA, well, and the point. legislative agencies that, hey, we're stressed about this because we can't deal with it. We're, well, I think I've heard you say before we are... 10% of 1% of all tobacco sold in the United States or something like that. It's a half of 1% of all tobacco. Half of 1% of all tobacco sold in the United States. And I just don't understand where this vehement legislation is coming from when, in fact, we are a small industry. Well, they know well, that the cigar smoker, he's never going to go away. Mm. I mean, you can, you can put regulations on it. You can make a prohibition that there's no more cigar smoking. They're still going to smoke cigars. They'll just create a black market. They have to understand that. That's history well, repeating itself. Mm-hmm. Yep. Taxation on cigarettes emphatically proves the power of the black market. And there's no better example that organized crime and the black market come into play when you play games with taxation the way they have for cigarettes. And was, the cigars will absolutely uh, be no different in that regard. And in terms of manufacturers just being able to deal with it, I'm afraid that's sort of a, a head in the sand type of a, approach. Yeah, it's got to be realistic about the harmful effects of these regulations, whether it's the user fees or a ban on free samples. You ban free samples, you ban the trade show. You ban a trade show. 
<clears throat> you're going to ban Big Smoke and, and Great Smoke and Little Puff and every other cigar event that's held throughout this country because it's all built around the ability for manufacturers to say, here, I want you to try this cigar. Everybody's palate is different. I hope you like it so that you'll buy a box of them or two or three of them. It's the marketing backbone of this industry, and we're going to make it a federal offense for me to hand a, a, a consumer, as, as a, you guys, as, as cigar reps, to walk into a store and hand a consumer a cigar complimentary and saying, I hope you like it so that you might buy some? Glenn, We're going to make that a federal offense? Glenn, does Michigan already have that? Because I just heard that from one of my reps in the Midwest who doesn't live in Michigan. But if he did and I had to send him samples, I'd have to pay a tax on those samples. Well, that's a tax issue as opposed to a regulatory measure where we're simply saying we're not going to uh, – there's too many of these bureaucrats that have the, the memory of the days when you could go to a NASCAR event and throw Copenhagen and Winston's into the stands. And they think that's what we're doing and mm-hmm. that this is a pathway to getting children you know, illegally tobacco. When we all know that, that cigar shops are, are adult venues that are – protected by great regulation, they're protected by card check. We know that cigar shop owners do not allow minors into their establishments in the first place, and yet our opposition tries to paint a directly opposite picture of, of that. So what you experienced with Michigan with your reps is purely a tax issue that's come up in Georgia. I think it's come up in Kentucky as well. And um, yeah, that's the state trying to get their claws into the tax side of the qu- equation versus a federal regulation that makes it a federal offense to hand them out. You know what Michigan did? This is a, a, a good – Michigan had the Super Bowl, I don't know, five, six years ago, something like that. And uh, they generated some revenue into Detroit, which Detroit, I think, you know, we all know was a decimated mm-hmm. economy. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the year, every person in the NFL responsible in the NFL, not just players but production assistants and staff, they got an assess or a, a tax – a letter saying that, oh, you know, you you, they have a one day thing. If you make uh, any money in this in the state, even for one day, then you owe tax on it. So if you're talking about an NFL player for a Super Bowl, maybe he got two hundred and fifty, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. He got assessed a tax letter saying you owe this much tax. And they said, okay, they won the battle, but they lost the war because the NFL said, well, you'll never have a Super Bowl again. Absolutely. Well, the states are, you know, think they're starving for income, and they're looking under every single rock. I mean, we've gotten emails from from consumers in states where they ordered, you know, a consumer ordered cigars online, and they got a tax bill because, you know, the state tax department can contact the mail order company and say, fork over your records, blah, blah, blah. They're looking under every conceivable rock for the revenue, and that's why, again, we have to be diligent on these measures at the st- as much at the state level as we do in Washington. Uh Glenn, I want to thank you very much for, for coming back on the show. Uh, these issues are very important to all of us, whether we're consumers, media, and cigar manufacturers. Uh, so, again, thank you very much for coming back on. We look forward to having you back on for our four-year anniversary show uh, on October 30th, where we're going to uh, promote CRA and encourage people to join the CRA. And I'll, you know, I'll do that now. Join the CRA. And get active in the cause. Or renew. Or even just Renew. Renew. Yeah, no, right. Don't let it lax. Yep. I, I like the lifetime membership. That's that's what I did. How do, how do you do? How do you how do you sign up, Glenn? Go to cigarrights.org. Go to cigarrights.org. Top right uh, column says join. Couldn't get more clear than that. Join. Uh, pick the level that you would like to join. There's cost savings, as you mentioned, for for joining um, online for different. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, and and uh, lifetime memberships. And if you anybody does want a lifetime membership. Yes, we take the installment plan. So you can set that up uh, online as well. Uh, I think we charge $500 for a lifetime membership, which is about $1,000 cheaper than an NRA lifetime membership. But uh, we really try to make it worth everybody's while. You get a membership card. It's good for discounts at cigar shops across the country. You get cool stuff, too. I got, like, cases, it, cigars, shirts, yeah, hats. A Glenn good. Loop bow tie. A Glenn that's Loop what bow. I think should be a week. I think that should be a good one. I've got to say one. this. <laughs> I've got to, you brought it up. I've got to say this. Within the next seven days, we're rolling out the official bow tie of Cigar Rights of America. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's oh, about uh, time. Quickly, Breaking quickly, news Allison, on Stogie Geese. I, Googled, I gotta say this. We Googled, I Googled cigar bow ties, and one company in the entire country comes up. Lee Allison Tie Company in Chicago. 
and we were out. We were out for the little puff event, little smoke little event, little smoke in uh, Wisconsin. So we fly into Chicago. I said, I got to find these guys. And I found the Lee Allison tie company. And now we have bundles of them that have been shipped to Washington. We have the long tie and we have the bow tie and it is the official tie of the CRA. So wear them proudly when they roll out. So you were joking, but hey, it's coming. No, <laughs> that's joking. Awesome. That's Joe awesome. Glenn, why would I joke? I don't joke. <laughs> you don't kid, nobody kids about bow ties. Yeah, that's right. No, yeah. no, okay. that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming back on the Stogie Geek Show. Thanks, Thanks guys. Anytime. With Appreciate that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and do our debonair ideal segment for the uh, for this show, which is going to talk about memorable, to- memorable times when we have a cigar. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 